What's up, everybody? Welcome to another edition of the Surf and Sales Podcast. I'm Scott Lease here with my co-host and good friend, Richard Harris. And today, we are coming to you live with Austin Belsack from New York City, founder of Cultivated Culture and owner of one of, if not the largest followings on LinkedIn that I have come across from somebody who uh, is, a, is a peer and, and, and not like a super, super famous person. Uh, so welcome to the show, Austin. Thanks for having me, guys. It's great to be here. I appreciate it. Yeah, today's show, by the way, everybody, is brought to you by our sponsor, Lead411. Lead411, where you can get unlimited mobile direct phone numbers, sales intent data via role changes, jobs and fundings, and a slick Chrome extension that plugs into LinkedIn. So check out Lead411. Dude, if you're working from home and it's all about mobile, like, why wouldn't you want that? Like, I don't know how you could not not want that, assuming it's I I I only heard about Lead Four One One in the last couple of weeks, and I'm I'm getting more and more excited about it. So me too. Uh, me too. Everybody should take a look at it. So Austin, you just told us that there's a tropical storm in the area. So I want to warn everybody that you know if you cut out and the power goes <laughs> out, that's why we didn't just give you the boot because you were not a good guest or something like that. So hopefully, uh, hopefully things are are okay there. Give us give everybody some context, you know, of your background, what your sales experience is like, what you're selling right now, and what you're up to. Yeah, for sure. I mean, so I, I jumped into sales early on and I've, I've been in uh, many different kind of facets of the industry. So I started out in medical device sales, which is very, very different than, you know, an SDR type of relationship or, or an account executive type of relationship at, uh, you know, a technology company or anything like that. Transitioned into doing my own sales to start a freelance agency so I could get some of that digital experience and make the transition into tech and eventually wound up with uh, interviews and offers at Google and Twitter and Microsoft. So I accepted the role at Microsoft, less of an uh, outbound sales role, more of a partnerships role. So my whole goal is to basically find channel partners who will resell uh, our advertising to small to medium sized businesses so we can hit that long tail of the funnel. I've been doing that for about five years now. Um, first year, I, I hit our, our platinum club for attainment, which is essentially top 1% at the company. Uh, and then four or five months after starting at Microsoft, I also started my business, uh, Cultivated Culture, which is essentially aimed at teaching people how to be more effective at, at the job search. So we've been at that for four years or so. Um, I basically, uh, the, the sales for that is, is a little less traditional. Um, I generate a lot of leads through LinkedIn. Scott, you kind of called it out with the following there. Uh, I do a lot of coaching and then I also have a couple of courses that I sell. So very different funnel, a little bit more on the automated side, uh, than, than you might see, you know, selling a product like, like advertising at Microsoft. So it really runs the gamut there and there, there's been a lot going on and, and it's been a fun ride for sure. You know, what, what you do right now, is, is so interesting and relevant with everybody looking for jobs right now and you know considering um, trying to get creative with different outreach strategies and everything. I mean, on your, on your profile, it says, I like, teach people how to use unconventional strategies to land jobs. First of all, Richard and I have said this many times before, but like we are obsessed with the job hunting process. Like if I could get comped to just do interviews all, all day long, I would love to do that. Um, so give, give, give the people out there, you know, a couple of your best tips for right now in this moment, like things that somebody could execute today, like one or two unconventional strategies. So they get a sense of, of what you teach and, and maybe they can go apply it right now. Yeah, for sure. And the thing, the interesting thing about, you know, the word unconventional is, is, you know, who it's directed to, because I'm sort of speaking to everybody with that word, but really my job search process is, is if you peel back all the, the marketing layers, it's a sales process. And I think about it the exact same way that you would think about filling a pipeline and, and closing deals. So traditionally, you know, what's sort of forced on us or, or what we're taught is the way to go is you know, creating a resume, applying online and rinsing and repeating until, you know, lo and behold, somebody decides to like pick your, your name out of the, the hat. And any salesperson knows if you're, if your strategy relies on your name being picked out of a hat, you're, you're going to be in trouble pretty quickly. So for me, you know, the whole deal was let's start, let, let's approach this the same way I approach my number. You know, I, I understand my average deal size. I understand all the steps in the process. I understand my success rates at every step. Let me walk it back to a, a starting point that makes sense. 
And so the unconventional strategies, there's really two core principles of the job search a process that I use, which are one, you, you got to get a referral. So you have to be building relationships. You don't necessarily need to know the person at the company. It doesn't have to be a family friend. You know, we, we can go build relationships with anybody, same as we do in sales. And so I'm going to go find that person who can have a direct impact over my ability to get hired into this role. I'm going to go do a ton of research on their company. I'm going to do a ton of research on them. I'm going to understand what they care about, what their needs are, what goals they have. I'm going to play into that. I'm going to add value. I'm going to build that relationship and work to get that referral. The second piece is finding a creative way to add value. So stepping outside of the, the resume box and putting something together that makes sense to the other side. Because the problem with resumes and the problem with cover letters is we want, we just don't sell that way anywhere else. We don't use that language. We don't use that format. It's super outdated. You know, pause, we put the pause right there. Put, awesome. It's, yeah, go for it. It's all good. And Scott and I are, you know, Scott and I are sitting here going, God, is this guy cracked the, cracked the code further than we did. And he just created this massive passive income stream. So now we're going to be angry at you. Yeah, the, answer, the answer is yes. The answer yes. Is yes. Uh, but, but seriously, one of the things we like to do is we really want to dive in deep on some of this stuff. So talk about when you say understanding their needs, right? And I completely agree with you doing the research, but are you talking about the needs of the organization related to the job? Are you talking about the needs of who you think the hiring manager is? Like, just, I just want to make sure that I know the answer, but I want to make sure the listeners understand it too. And, and maybe you have a different perspective as well. So my goal with, with the needs piece is, is really to rephrase that I'm looking for something that the person I'm engaging with cares about so I can build a relationship with them. Because when we think about the job search process, you know, the first thing that most people do is they go think about, you know, where do my friends work? Where do my meaningful connections work? And can they refer me in? And so, you know, I didn't, I didn't create my circle of friends by understanding their business needs and offering them value. They became my friends through different channels, but they can still refer me in just the same. And so, there are many ways to get a referral and there are many ways to engage people. So what I'm looking at is this person and all the information I have about them. I'm going to take that. I'm going to say, what's my best way in here. It could be something personal. You know, let's say that uh, I'm really into surfing and, and you guys are into surfing and, and that's what we connect on. And we start talking about that, yada, yada, yada. And then down the road, maybe it gets into business and then maybe it leads to a referral. Whereas somebody else, maybe I see a direct path through something with their business. Maybe I see an opportunity for them. Uh, maybe I can introduce them to somebody, so on and so forth. So I don't necessarily box it directly into, you know, this person has a business need. So I'm going to go right after that. That's very effective, but I'm really looking a little bit wider and just trying to understand how I can build a relationship with this person in some so, way. So let me ask you this question. Let's say I, I'm, you know, unemployed through COVID, right? And I completely agree with, you know, networking in your network. Do I choose to go to my network of people that I know first and say, hey, do you know of anything? Or do I go, you know what? First, I'm going to go find 10 companies I want to look at. And this week, I'm going to try and focus on maybe just two or three. And then based on the companies that I find, then look at my network to see if I can get referred in. Or is it really both? Is it a top-down, bottom-up approach? It's, it's both. So the loose connections are always a great way to get in the door. And you know, if, if you're unemployed, especially, sometimes we're, we're under some constraints when, when we're in that situation. And uh, you, know, you, you kind of take what you can get. Loose connections are always great. You know, my recommendation is just reaching out to them and saying, hey, I'm in the market. Uh, here's sort of, here's what I'm looking for. Be direct about it. And if you know of anybody who might be able to help me out, I'd really appreciate it. Simple as that. When you exhaust your network uh, or as you're working through your network, that's where the targeting comes in. So typically when I work with people, we'll set a target list of 10 to 15 companies. And, um, you know, to your point, it, it, this isn't, you know, we're going deep on those companies. This isn't the same as applying online, you know, let me send out 20 apps a day. We're going one mile wide and a hundred miles deep on all these companies. So I'm choosing 10 to 15 and I'm ordering them, you know, from high priority to low priority. And then I'm actually starting with the low priority companies and I'm working my way up. And that allows me to get a little bit more practice, a little bit more confidence. And I also can do some better A-B testing and make those mistakes in a, in a low stakes environment. So that when I get up to those higher companies, um, those higher priority companies, I understand what works, what doesn't, you know, what makes sense to me. So I can put my best foot forward with those top tier companies. So I'd say it's a little bit of both. God, I, lo I love so much what you just said about starting with the <clears throat> sort of 
lower priority companies and working your way up to the, the other ones. I can't tell you how often I come across founders and sales leaders who are trying to build their, their sales organization, organizations out and they start by going after the whales. They start by going after like the biggest accounts there are and I'm always like, no, 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 no. You gotta start at the, at the small ones because you're still trying to like rehearse and practice and figure out like what are messaging and pitches that works and I wanna get some customers so they break the product a little bit and we can fix it and whatnot. So I love that you've, you've basically taken like the startup sales guide right, to, to, to building a successful, scalable sales organization, and you flipped it and applied it into the hiring process. And that's, uh, that's really fucking brilliant. I, I, I love that so much. That's great. Is there any difference in your mind for some of these unconventional strategies for somebody who's trying to land, let's say, an SDR role right now, and somebody who's trying to land a VP level gig? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, as you get higher up the chain, um, the, the value that you need to portray or illustrate and also, you know, the size of, of um, the network that, that's out there for you shrinks a little bit. I mean, there's naturally just fewer VPs than there are SDRs. So how, do I, so how, do I, how do I stand out more as a VP? Let, let's, let's shift the conversation to, you know, sales leadership, people who are out there listening. I, I have a list right now of probably 50 people that I know from LinkedIn who are VPs of sales on the market who have sent me messages in the last couple of weeks and are like, please help me find a, a gig. How do those folks help me secondhand pass advice to those folks on how they can stand out and try to get a gig? For sure. So for those guys, uh, I mean, there, there's, a, there's a couple of things that you can do and there, there's a couple of ways to approach it. Uh, right off the bat, I mean, I'm, I'm going to go make a list of the, the, anybody who can influence my ability to get hired. So whatever level you're at, that, that's what you want to have in mind. So if you're a VP, that's going to be another VP. That's going to be somebody at the C level. It could be a direct report or a direct report could be valuable in giving you information. So I'm going to go make a target list of companies or uh, contacts rather after I make that target list of companies. And I'm usually aiming for around 150 total contacts um, with the response rates that I see and kind of the attrition through the, the funnel. That number tends to put you in a really good spot in terms of the odds. And then at that point, if I'm a VP, uh, I'm going to try, I'm playing a little bit of the longer game. It's definitely going to be, you know, a little bit tougher. I'm not just going to be able to, if I'm an SDR, I can show up to a VP and say, Hey, I want to learn from you, mentor me. It's hard for a VP to say that to another VP or, or even a C-level person in some cases. So what I'm going to be doing instead is taking a bit more of a consultative approach. So there's a bunch of, I mean, we could, we could spend hours talking about the different ways that you can go about this. Some of my favorites, maybe two or three here. One, I'm, I'm going to go find who's active on LinkedIn and I'm just going to start showing up and commenting on their stuff. When you, um, say, when you say who's active, okay, so I'm a, I'm a VP level candidate on the market and you say go see who's active. Are you talking about other VPs? Or are you talking about CEOs and founders? Mm -hmm. Whose stuff are you talking about? So I'm talking about the people on our target list. So I have my list of 150 contacts, the, the rule of the internet, any internet community out there, there's, there's a thing called the 1% the rule or the 99-1 rule. And that essentially says that 1% of a community is going to be creating original content. 9% is going to be engaging with that original content and 90% is going to be lurking. So if I extrapolate that to my list of 150 contacts, you know, I can come up with those numbers. Um, but essentially, I'm going to be looking at about 15, maybe 20 people who are going to be fairly active on LinkedIn that, that I can engage with. But anytime somebody is putting themselves out there on the web, uh, they're posting content, they're engaging with other people's content, they have a podcast, they have a personal site. Uh, those people just tend to naturally be more inclined to connect online. And so I'm going to take advantage of that. I'm not just going to send them a cold email and say, Hey, Scott, you're a VP really want to work at your company. You know, can we, can we hop on the phone? Instead, I'm going to show up on their posts and I'm going to leave some thoughtful comments. I'm going to read what they posted. I'm going to read their comment. I'm going to reply. I'm going to add value. I'm going to basically take the approach. We, we do all the, the, uh, the, they bring the improv people in for us at Microsoft to do the team building exercises and the, uh, the yes. And thing is, is what we learn a lot. And so I'm going to do that same thing. Somebody comments, somebody leaves a post. I'm going to say, Yes, and blah, 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 blah. And I'm going to add in some value from my side. And I'm just going to rinse and repeat that. I'm going to show up a couple times every week. I'm going to get on their radar. And then I'm going to say, hey, Scott, you know, I've been really loving what you're posting, especially this, that, and the other thing. You know, 
I think I, I want to introduce you to uh, my buddy, Justin Welsh. You know, he, he may be a great person for Thursday night sales. Um, obviously, you've already made that connection, but introducing you to, to somebody uh, who's mutually beneficial, um, you know, adding some value in some way. I'm going to try and leave with that. And then I'm going to try and get the conversation at a certain point. Um, essentially, the way I'm approaching this is sort of like a, a bank account. You know, if, if what I want at the end of the day is a referral, uh, maybe that cost me 20 like social dollars, let's say. So if I just try to show up and say, hey, you know, I'm making that withdrawal, I'm going to overdraw my account. But if I make small deposits in the form of commenting on your posts or making mutually beneficial introductions or identifying gaps in your sales process or showing you some tools that may be helpful or whatever it is, I'm slowly adding deposits and I'm going to work my way up to that 20 bucks. And then since I've uh, added enough value to you, I can confidently make that ask. So that's really what I'm going for here. I'm looking for the value add approach. And it's almost like, um, you know, when, when I was a kid, we were playing soccer and the coach was always like, guys, five passes before you shoot, like stop just shooting the ball in the first touch. And that's the same kind of thing here. You want to make those five passes in terms of adding value to the other person. And then you can go for the shot. That you just, you just won Scott over like 10 minutes ago. And then with the soccer <laughs> reference, you know, <laughs> oh, I, I, I saw the banner behind him. Or I was going to say, I'm just, I'm just, we, have, we, have to di we have to digress for a bit. Do you, who are you following in the Premier League? Are you a Liverpool guy? Or are you? Uh... So I'm not a big soccer fan. My brother-in-law is. So we just watched, uh, was it Man U and Bournemouth? We watched those, those guys play. And then I, I missed the Bayern uh, face-off later that day. But uh, I'm, I'm not a big soccer guy. But hey, live, live sports are on. So I'm, I'm watching. We're there. So I have a question. I want you to just go back. Well, you know, what is the name of that rule? The nine, the one percent ninety nine. Like, what did you call that? Yeah. So it's uh, the the Wikipedia page has it as the one percent rule, uh, but some people also call it the the ninety nine one, just breaking it out by the percentages. But if you do a quick search for the one percent rule and then internet communities, it should pop right up. Okay, got it. So talking about all this, and I and you know, I, I love you know. I call it karma, right? You, you're calling, you know, deposits and withdrawals and all that. I'm just sort of like, it's all about karma. Totally. Uh, and I like your, your five touches, right? So you got to do five touches before you even really try to engage, right? Before you, before you present an ask. What, once you've done those five touches, what's your ask? Let's say I have, I've gone in, I've commented on something. I've done a yes and, which I love. Um, Maybe I've, I've, I've maybe politely disagreed to try and drive some interest, right? Like, hey, what about this perception? You know, one, should you even do that? And then two, but after I've done those five touches, now what am I going to say when I reach out to Scott to try and chat? Sure. So I think it's the, the, the best answer is it depends because the relationship is, you know, going to be in a different place with everybody that you're talking to after those five touches. Some people come right out of the, the out of the gate and say, you know, hey, we're hiring for this role. I've really loved our conversations. Can I pass your resume along or are you interested? Um, some people, you know, you'll want to get on the phone with them and maybe they need a little TLC still. So you're going to get on the phone and, and you're just going to kind of have a conversation, but, but build them up. Um, even if you're... How do I get them on the phone? How do I get them to take the call? I, I, would, I would just ask for it. Scott, go ahead. Sorry, were you going to say something? No, 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 no. Okay, cool. But it's so, um, okay. so, so Austin, hey, Austin, uh, been really enjoying your content lately. Um, I'd love to get on the phone with you and just sort of network. Like, is that what I'm saying? Does, how do I not sound cheesy and desperate, right? Like, sure. So, uh, so Scott, you posted about a uh, second book you're writing today. Yeah. 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 Cool. So maybe, uh, maybe I've uh, popped on Thursday night sales a couple times. Um, and then maybe I've been commenting on your post, you know, we're talking about documenting, uh, your, your stuff, um, you know, documenting your wins and your, your yep. results and all that good stuff. And then I see your second book comes out. And, uh, so maybe I send Scott an email and I say, Hey Scott, uh, it, it's been, uh, it's been great chatting with you on LinkedIn. You know, we haven't, we haven't connected, you know, this podcast hasn't happened. We haven't connected on the phone yet. Uh, I saw you're coming out with the second book. You know, I, I've loved what you've said. I'd love to pre-order some copies, but I'd also love to find a way to get copies in the hands of more people. You know, I want to help you spread your message. Uh, do you have 10 minutes, 15 minutes to jump on the phone and, and talk about that? And boom, you know, I, I would imagine, you know, in, in, if I make a compelling case of, you know, I want to buy 15 copies for my team, or I want to, you know, buy 40 copies for this group that I'm in or, or whatever it is, 
um, even if there's no group, right? Just you buy the copies, uh, you know, get, get, get Scott on the phone that way, start talking, start, start going back and forth. Um, and then you don't even have to, you don't have to go for the referral. You don't have to end the call with, with an ask on your side. Maybe, maybe that's one of your five touch points. But if I, if I get to that level where now, you know, Scott's got his second book coming out and I've found a way to secure 10, 15 copies, whatever it is. Uh, if, if I, I feel like we'd be at a good point where after a little while, um, you know, m maybe a week later, two weeks later, I come back and I say, Hey, Scott. Uh, you know, we got those books, um, you know, people are loving them. By the way, you know, there's been a couple of changes at, at my company. And, uh, you know, COVID's really impacted us in, in X, Y, and Z ways. And I'm thinking about making a, a switch. You know, I see that you're obviously a thought leader in the space, you got a lot of connections. Um, you know, if, if there's anybody that uh, you'd be willing to introduce me to or anybody that, you know, you think I should talk to just would really appreciate, uh, you know, you pointing me in the right direction. Simple as that. And, so um, so that first, even that first call, and I, and I agree with 100% with what you're saying is, mm -hmm. I'm still not trying to say, hey, can you help me? I'm still trying to say, how can I help you? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And, and even if you, if you get to the point, so again, th those five touches are really good uh, sort of line, line to draw. Sorry, go ahead, Scott. Sorry to interrupt, Richard, but like, Austin's even taking it a step further. He's like, he's delivering value. He's not even like offering value. Like, check out this link. That's, in my opinion, that's offering value. If Austin is like, hey, I just bought like a case of your, your books and scattered them about the universe to my clients. He's like, that's like already delivered value to me. The rule of reciprocity then is so strong. <laughs> so what am I going to tell him no for his 15, 30 minute ask of That's what I was going to jump in with is like, you're massively leveraging the rule of reciprocity. So right? it's, but for folks who don't know that, it just basically means that humans feel indebted to return good deeds. If someone does a good deed for me, I feel indebted to do it, right? To return that favor. So it's fantastic. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut no, you off. No, I mean, so I'm loving this because I'm actually reading uh, Influence by, by Robert Cialdini uh, for the, the nth time right now. And uh, one of my favorite takeaways is the, the rule of reciprocity. So the study that he cites came out of Cornell. And essentially the way it worked is uh, he had people come in and, and more for the listeners here than you guys, because it sounds like we're, we're on the same page, but he had people come in and uh, rate paintings. And they were in the room with one other person who was the, the, the researcher's assistant, uh, unbeknownst to the, the painting rater. They thought they were just doing the same thing. So about halfway through the exercise, the assistant would leave the room and he would come back with two cans of Coke, uh, or he wouldn't. That, those were kind of the control and, and the, the variable groups. Um, and so he would come back and he would say, hey, I talked to the, the researcher. Um, he allowed me to, to get a Coke. I bought one for you. Uh, and they went, they went about their, their merry way. And then at the end of the session, at the end of ratings, um, the person who brought in the Coke, the assistant, then said, hey, by the way, I'm trying to win a contest and I have to buy a certain amount of raffle tickets or I have to sell a certain amount of raffle tickets. Would you be willing to buy some? So overwhelmingly, the people who were gifted the can of Coke, again, Scott, to your point, delivering, uh, instead of just kind of throwing something out there, delivering the can of Coke, those people overwhelmingly bought more tickets and they actually bought more than the Coke was worth. So at the time, uh, this, this study's from, I think, 67 or something like that, Coke was 10 cents, but people were willing to buy $1.25 worth of raffle tickets. So they took the, the research a step further and they, they ran the same study and they actually asked the participants whether or not they liked the assistant uh, and, and it was crazy because the results held that it didn't matter if they liked the assistant or not, they still bought the tickets. So at the end of the day, um, you know, the rule of reciprocity is, is so, so powerful. I mean, Richard, to your point, like you're leveraging it so much that, that it's really hard for the other person to say no, if you're showing up and, and doing that delivery. And so the five touch points are delivery. If I can, I mean, Scott, I cherry picked your example because that's like the golden goose right there. And that's not going to be the case, you know, every time. But um, that, that puts me in a really, really good position to make an ask, especially if my ask is viewed uh, maybe from, from your all's perspective as something that's uh, lower in value than what I gifted to you. You know, buying 15 copies of Scott's book, a 10 minute phone call may be lower in value than the 15 copies. So I'm, I'm even more likely to get it at that point. Yeah, there's a, there's a great story. You can Google it. I, I don't know if it's folklore or true that how Ben Franklin used the rule of reciprocity to get someone to change their mind and support him. 
um, in in some of the framework of you know what was happening around that time. So it's a, it's a fascinating it's a fascinating theory. I, I I teach it. I talk about it all the time. So I'm glad you brought it up. I want to talk about you know the traditional, right? So you you talk about some non traditional stuff, which is brilliant, and you know it's interesting to me because all the stuff you're telling me feels traditional to me because right. I had to do it. You know, right. through, through 2009 to 2010 and 11, I went through a couple of job searches and I sat down and I found the company, I found the people. I would comment and do stuff, but even 10 years ago, I think I could do it a little different. I, I did it a little bit differently because of the time. And I would apply online and then I would reach out to the HR person and say, who should I talk to? I'd reach out to who I think the hiring manager to say, who should I talk to? And then I, the, the other thing I did, which I called unconventional and I still think is I would pick up the phone and leave voicemails for it, right? Because as a salesperson, I'd be like, Hey, I'm the guy who just applied online, but I'm going to go a step beyond that. Cause I know nobody else is doing this. I'm calling you. Here's my cell phone number. And that was unconventional back then. Um, are you still seeing some of those, you know, what might be considered I, maybe more traditional, but maybe I just saw it as unconventional. Like where do you see the phone coming in in this play? Yeah, so the phone is an interesting one. Um, and I, I, from what I've seen, the phone is not quite as effective as it might have been back then. I think people naturally prefer to receive an email today. And I also think that we have a lot more control over the email side of things. But why wouldn't I do, why wouldn't I do all? Wouldn't I apply online, connect with them on LinkedIn, send an email, and make a phone call? You could, absolutely. Um, there, there's no downside to doing that outside of your time. It's harder to do that. It's harder to do all those things across 150 contacts. And so I am looking for the balance in scale and effectiveness. To me, the difference between dialing up 150 and this may, you know, if you're an SDR, this is, this is a day at the office, right? So whatever. But for me, you know, I can batch send 150 emails and I can rip through those, you know, with a little bit of personalization and tweaking using something like a yesware pretty easily. Um, and then I can take that extra time where, you know, I would have called somebody and I can use that to potentially go do a little more research or take it another angle. What I see in a lot of cases is that the, the phone, and, and this is a bit different. I mean, with sales, we're picking up the phone a lot. And so some people will be more receptive in this industry versus some of the other industries that I coach people in. Um, I think you sort of have to know your audience and you, you have to know who you're talking to a little bit. Some of the digging that you do can help with that. Some of the initial conversations that you have can help with that. But again, if I just dial, so it, it, using Scott again as an example, if I get Scott's number and I just dial him up out of nowhere and I'm like, Hey Scott, I'm a job seeker. You got a cool company. I want to work there. You know, I'm calling you up to go above and beyond. What do you think? Scott may help me. I don't know, Scott, you, you can, you can speak for yourself, but I think that I would probably have a better chance if I had gone through those steps that we just talked about digitally. But first. Not, so that's where I'm, that's where I think that's where we're agreeing is I absolutely would do the other stuff first. I would send the email. I would send the LinkedIn. I would apply online. And then my message to Scott is, hey, I just applied online. Uh, I'm super interested, but I'm also picking up the phone because I know nobody else does. And if I'm calling a sales leader, I don't know a single sales leader in the world who wouldn't go, all right, the guy's got effort. Sure. He's got hooks. He's going to do it. And I know that it works because one, just because, oh, you know, now I'm going to brag. Um, one, I know it works because uh, I teach people to do this now and they do it and it still works. And two, it's how I actually met Scott. Like you're on this show because when I applied for a job to meet Scott, I sent him an email. I sent him a LinkedIn. I did have, now I did have a personal reference. I had a friend who, it, who, you know, I was able to name drop. Right. Um, so but that's so the all point. you had, you had all of the things you checked off all these different things <laughs> and whatnot. That's, that's, that's the part. That's and the part works. where I'm like, wait a minute. I did this 10 years ago and I didn't figure out how to scale this and make a business out of it. So now I'm angry at Austin <laughs> as much as I love Austin. Right. I want to I want to transition the the conversation for a few minutes um, over to like that your writing and your writing style and all that. I mean, you spent years as a you know writer, contributing author. I don't know the proper terms for Forbes and places like that. Is is how much did that prepare you for? the content creation side of building your brand and how successful you've been on LinkedIn. 
immensely uh, like no, no question and and i think you know what you see now is is almost 10 years in the making at, at this point and so it's it's sort of disingenuous because people ask me they're like austin how long does it take you to write a linkedin post and i'm like 10 minutes but you know that doesn't account for the 10 years of of stuff that went into you know being able to write that in 10 minutes and yeah. so you know when i graduated from from college uh, I, I started looking up to all these people who had these online businesses and they, they were really the the role models for me and, and sort of the goal. And I studied the way that they wrote things. Um, I, I would read an email and I would say, do I like this email or do I not? And if so, why do I like it? And if not, uh, do I not like it because it's not targeted at me or do I not like it because it's not working on me? And I would have a swipe file. I would save all the ones that I liked. Um, I would save some of the ones I didn't like. I would notate them. Um, and I, I did that and then I got my job at Microsoft and then I started cultivating culture uh, and I just started writing blog posts on the site and I, that was the transition of you know consuming and studying other people's stuff and then creating on my side and that was four years ago and then over four years you know you get a little bit better about understanding what content plays well what doesn't um, and then eventually I mean I've been on LinkedIn for a year and a half and that the reason the content is the way that it is, is from, you know, the previous eight years of studying other people's stuff. And then also, you know, I think one of the biggest things, just, Justin Welsh and I were talking about this, but one of the biggest things we hear from people is, you know, how do you come up with all these content ideas? Well, when you've been, when you've been writing about the same subject for eight years, you know, you've sort of figured out all of the ideas that are out there. And, and honestly, then you realize that you haven't even tapped into all the ideas that are out there. There's so much else. And so the stuff that I, that you see now, like a post that I just made today or yesterday is the product of studying other people's stuff for about two, three years, writing my own posts for about three, four years, and then still like put, making my first, first post on LinkedIn and refining that over a year and a half. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, it's, it's fascinating. I mean, I, I rarely find people who have six times the amount of you know, followers that I do and who have, and who have done it in a year and a half, like you said, I mean, you're like a, you know, you're like a, a rocket ship, if you will, <laughs> of LinkedIn, um, you know, brand building and, and the, and the content is, is always interesting and very consistent and stuff. And, you know, as I've slowly been getting to know you here, like one of the things that caught my attention was all of your background in, in writing. And so I've been curious if that helped you. It's like, I'm not a writer, right? Like I don't have journalism background. This has been something, this is a skill set that I've had to learn over the years. And as sales has evolved and the line between salesperson and marketing has blurred or blended, salespeople now have to have writing skills and, and journalistic like acumen more and more and more. And, and you could almost argue in some arenas that being a good content creator and writer is more important than your skills on the phone now in selling. That's a debatable point, but I'm in these threads all the time where people are like, Oh, I make no calls and I, I'm never on the phone and all I do is write. So it's interesting to hear you talk about, and it's a good point. Like you didn't just, you know, start writing one day and, and dominate. You're like, well, <laughs> I wrote for 10 years <laughs> and studied and figure out what was working and what wasn't. I want to I want to dig in on that because we I hear this a lot like you know we've talked to Sarah Brazier who's got a great following and writes really well uh, we're talking to you you said you went back and you sort of studied your own writing which is a little bit like going back and listening to your own sales calls right through a course or a gong or, or any of those places or watching yourself on film if you you know were a yeah, performer or an athlete. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah yeah what are you looking for what do you if you were going to teach me to be appropriately self evaluating what am i looking to get better at because i think that's where a lot of people are like well you know you just got to write then you got to figure it out but how do i study myself to figure it out yeah so i mean met metrics are very helpful right and i think there's uh there there's there's a couple things that i look at so the first is uh the topic so i've shared posts on every range of topic that I can think of and consistently 
the number one thing that gets the most engagement is a personal story, either my own or, or somebody else that I've worked with. So that has come from just rereading everything. But then how do, how do I tell that personal story? You know, if I just came out and, and threw some content out there that may or I see people sharing personal stories on LinkedIn all the time, but they don't pick up hundreds of thousands of views. So there's a specific way to, to tell that story. And um, it really comes down to uh, it's line by line for me. So the goal that I have in, in my LinkedIn posts, and if I had to summarize my strategy in, in one uh, sort of nugget, it's my, my goal when writing a sentence is to make sure that you feel like you have to read the next sentence. That's, that's literally what it comes down to. And so that's the reason why, you know, I, I see a lot of people commenting on like the, the, the posts that are line by line by line by line. Um, but that really enforces that. And then building in some cliffhangers into those lines or, you know, getting people, pushing people to that next line. I go back and I look and I say, you know, rereading this, does, does this story still make sense? Is it compelling? Is every line in here pushing people to the next line. Could I have used more compelling language? Um, you know, what, did, I, did I start this off with a hook that gets people to click the see more button? Um, did I mess up with, did I not pay attention to the spacing to, to get people to that see more button? Did I end this in a way that entices people to say, holy shit, I have to like that post. I have to comment on that post. Like that ending, like punched me in the stomach. Uh, and to be honest, I, I, uh, I keep data and I'm very particular about a lot of things. Something that I haven't thought about too, too much, um, given that most of my focus has been on the job search is like reflecting on exactly what the process looks like for going back through my posts and, you know, what I look for specifically and how I improved it. I mean, really what I've done is just gone back and looked at them and, and covered the things that we just talked about and said, all right, how can I make the next post better? How can I take what I've learned and, and inject it into the next post? The other thing I'll say is it's all about experimentation and, and that goes for everything we've talked about, job search, content creation, anything else. And so I'll throw a post out there just because, just to see how it plays. I, I may think that it's not the most well-written post. I may think that it may not do well, but my experience with LinkedIn and just creating content in general is that uh, I, can, I can sometimes make a fool out of myself in, if I try to time the market versus just putting my time in the market. So I've had posts that I thought would suck that took off and got hundreds of thousands of views. I've had posts that I thought would crush it. Go ahead. It's funny. You, you almost oversell yourself in your writing if mm -hmm. you're not careful, right? Yeah, so it's, that's absolutely. Good. That's probably some of the best tactical advice. You know, the cliffhanger thing I like, making people want to read the next sentence. Like that's, that's really tac tactical. I appreciate you, you giving that. I can, I can, I can 100% tell you that I don't do the things that Austin is talking about. <laughs> and, and I don't mean that in the sense that he's wrong. I mean it in the sense of this is why he has six times more followers than I do. Like he's taking some of the things that I'm just kind of intuitively or haphazardly doing and succeeding with, and he's turned it into a science. And that's the same thing that you do if you're a salesperson and then you're trying to grow your, your book and be consistent as a seller. It's the same thing if you're a sales manager. Take what's in your head put it on paper, study it, take the data, apply it as a science. It's the same thing if you're a VP of sales, right? Same thing if you're building businesses. And it's the same thing if you're going about building your personal brand. If Scott wants to do better and bigger things, I should follow Austin's playbook right here. And so should you, Richard. It'd be, it'd be interesting. We don't have enough time to do it. But I'm like, Austin, go look at me and Richard's last post and like, tell us how shitty they are. And, and yes. Give us like feedback of what we should have done better. <laughs> that would be like a, a fascinating you, study. You, so I, I got one more question around the LinkedIn stuff um, and, and then I'll turn it back over to Scott. But do you try to time the market with your post on LinkedIn? No, uh, occasionally. Um, and, and what does I, that mean for you? If you time the market, what does that mean? What's your, what is your analysis of the best time to post in theory? Uh, so when I say time in the market, I'm, I'm, I'm not necessarily talking about time in the literal sense. I'm just saying like at, at this point after writing for close to 10 years and having a year and a half of data on my LinkedIn posts, I have a pretty good sense at this point of a post that's going to play incredibly, incredibly well. And so if I'm trying to 
push. So for today, I, I, I have a lot of free tools on my, on my site for job seekers. And I had a post that I did a long time ago where I shared uh, my favorite job search tools and it, and it blew up. And so now I can rewrite that same post, but just swap in my own free tools and expect a similar result. And that's kind of exactly what happened. So uh, before the podcast, I think it was sitting at, been up for three hours. I think it had 1500 reactions or something and, and it's still climbing. And uh, that's simply because I, I have an understanding of, you know, w which of my posts are going to play well and how to write them. And if I want to inject something like I want to market my own tools, I'm going to leverage that to, you know, my, my, I'm, no, I'm going to leverage my knowledge and my strengths there. But if I only do that, one, there's, there's a finite amount of quality ideas that I have within that space. It takes me time to come up with a quality idea that I can turn into a surefire rocket ship post. I can't be doing that every single day. Otherwise I would. Um, but outside of that, I also lose out if I'm not experimenting. So if I try to just go with the rocket ship formula every single day, one, it's going to lose its luster. Um, because if I keep doing the same, here's a story about somebody formula over and over and over and over, people are going to just get used to that and it's going to taper off. So actually tr like kind of spring, it's like salt. If I, if I throw the entire salt shaker in the meal, it's going to taste like shit. But if I sprinkle it in every now and then in the right places, it's going to taste amazing. Same kind of thing here. And experimenting is really important because I'm, I don't know if, if there's always another post that's going to be a rocket ship formula, but I'm not going to figure that out if I'm not throwing stuff out there. And so I have to be willing to take a lower engagement on a post in order to understand what else is out there in terms of higher engagement. So All right, I'm gotta, always testing. I'm going to, I'm, I'm gonna, I lied. I'm going to ask two more questions and then I'm, then sure. I'm going to back to Scott. One, how do you manage the OCD of getting off of LinkedIn, not to follow your likes and comments, right? Like people become obsessed with this stuff and it's actually unhealthy. Like yeah. we're not careful, right? And yeah. I, you know, I would assume because of who you are and what you can accomplish, you don't really worry about it as much, right? You're, you're like, I know, you know, like I can come back to this. So that, that's the first question. The second question is, I'm gonna test your writing skills. What should we name the title of this episode to the podcast? <laughs> Okay, we'll, we'll uh, get, let, let me uh, let me work on that in the background. Um, so for for the the first question, I mean, so th this has been a big thing for me. Uh, you know, bur burnout has been a, a pretty real part of of my life, especially working full time and, and doing this on the side. And so with LinkedIn, to be honest, I, I really don't spend too much time on the platform. It's pretty regimented. I don't have any social media apps on my phone. I don't have the LinkedIn app on my phone. I don't have my email on my phone. Um, if I want to get there, I have to use the browser, which is a terrible experience and kind of encourages me to not use it, or I have to open up my computer. So the way it works for me is I post every day at around 9 a.m., between 9 and 9, 10. Um, and then I sit there on LinkedIn for uh, about 30 minutes or so until 9.45 or so, and I'll just reply to all the comments. And at the same time, I go seek out people. So I have a list of people, you know, Justin Welsh posts it at 9.05 a.m. I'm going to go comment on his post. You know, I'm going to go check Scott's profile and see if he's posted something. I have a list of people that I just go check their profiles and I engage with, with what they've posted. And then in, in between, I go comment on my, my, the comments on my posts. So we haven't jumped into the algorithm part too much. And, uh, you know, there's, that's sort of the, the two pieces to the puzzle. You can have really good content uh, and not really understand the algorithm and not be able to maximize your potential. Uh, you can also have not great content, but really have a good understanding of the algorithm and how to sort of manipulate and manufacture it. And you can end up, you know, blowing up. So one of the big things with the algo is that the amount of reactions you get in, in a short period of time uh, after posting really makes a difference on the full trajectory of your post. So the way LinkedIn works is when I post something, it spits my post out to a random sampling of my network. And it says, you know, hey, check this out. And if nobody likes it, if nobody shows up or engages, LinkedIn says, all right, nobody's interested. We're going to let this thing die a slow death. Um, but if, if an influx of people come in and like it, LinkedIn says, wow, people are interested in this. Let's send it to more people. And it sort of rinses and repeats. So when you're starting out, um, one, you can manufacture that a little bit. So when I started out, I had a list of 15 buddies, um, and my, my wife, a couple of my friends, you know, coworkers, and I would just ping them and I would say, hey, I just posted, would you mind give me a like and a comment. So that manufactured things a little bit. Now I post at the same time every day because I know that people in my audience will expect Austin to post between nine and nine ten. So they show up and that helps me sort of quote manufacture that engagement because I don't have to bank on the algorithm pushing it to the, the core 
group of enthusiastic followers in my audience. I just know that they're going to be there every day at 9 a.m. So that really helps me. Um, so anyways, I, re I reply to all the comments in the, in the thread that come in for the first 45 minutes of the post because that helps boost the engagement. Um, after that, I, I jump out of LinkedIn. Um, so at this point, I've posted, I've commented, I've replied to the comments on my post. I've engaged with other people I care about. Um, and then I'm off LinkedIn until the end of the day. So I have one more half hour period at the end of the day where I sh show back up. I reply to as many comments. I set a timer on my phone for 20 minutes. I reply to as many comments as I can get to. Um, and then I'll use the remaining time to kind of answer a, a couple of messages or engage with anybody else who I care about. And so I'm really spending about an hour a day total on the platform. Um, unless, you know, some days I, I feel better than others and I engage with more people and I spend a couple more hours. But for the most part, that's my schedule. That's great. That's really, really good. Solid. Right, so, so what are we going to name the episode? <laughs> what are you naming this episode? Um, how about... Uh, Hmm. It's a good question. There's so many directions we could go in. I don't know. Six figure LinkedIn following in six months. There you go. He can, he can, you can also get back to us. You have until, you have until Monday to give us that. Yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> we are, uh, we're up against it here and we're at the end of every show. We sort of like to turn it over to you and say, how can we be helpful to you? How can we support what you're doing? Is there any questions that you have you know, of us, is there anything you're working on you want to kind of call attention to? So this is your, uh, your time now. How can, how can we support you? Yeah, for sure. So I, I'm going to just add one more piece to what Richard asked at the beginning of the podcast. And uh, this goes under the bucket of, you know, something that, that I'm working on. So there's a concept called the value validation project, which I push. And that, that is the second unconventional strategy that goes with the job search. So relationship building is one thing, and that gets you in the door but you're still up against a lot of very, very qualified candidates in the interview process. So how do you then go about becoming the most valuable candidate? Well, a lot of people rely on you know, the resume and the interview answers and stuff like that. Uh, but really, that, that's not how we traditionally sell. So what I recommend and what I kind of teach people to put together is something that I call a value validation project. And that is essentially, I mean, the, the best way I can put it in this context is it's a pitch deck. And so you go do, from all the research you've done in the company, from all the conversations you've had, from all the nuggets that you've gained, uh, you put together a deck that highlights some area of opportunity, some problem, some gap, um, some new ideas for this company that, that is going to help them. And so, uh, you know, one example could be going and surveying the prospects and bringing some new information or data to the table, maybe going through their sales process on your own, pretending to be a customer. Um, what, one of my favorite examples in the sales space is back in the day when, when Foursquare was a bigger deal than it is now, uh, there's this guy named Tristan, uh, who was, uh, he was coming out of, you, you know, the story. Yeah. So he, he, he wanted to work there and he went out and he, he acted as a supporter of Foursquare and he just generated a bunch of leads and said, Hey, you have this sales position open. I'm ready to go. Here are the leads. And you know, no surprise, he got that position. Not to say that you need to go that far into it, but if you, you know, if you show up and you bring the value that they expect to see when, when you're hired or when this person is hired, it's really hard to choose somebody else who is just focusing on that resume, focusing on this cover letter, focusing on stuff that at the end of the day really isn't a great barometer of, you know, how they're, they, they will perform in the role. And then Richard, to your point, it's that, that's sort of the equivalent of calling the guy up and saying, you know, Hey, I'm putting in the extra effort. You know, this is going above and beyond to really showcase what you bring to the table. So, I'd recommend building those relationships and then leveraging the VVP. If you do those two things together, uh, that you, that, that's, a, that's a pretty good recipe for success in, in uh, my experience. I think that's going to be the name of, a, of the episode. Yes, you should build a deck as part of the interview process. And then people have to listen all the way to the very end. <laughs> right? I love it. Like, I love it. Genius marketing. Wait, way to hold that back, Austin. Well done. <laughs> well played. Well played. Master chess move right there. So uh, this has been a lot of fun and I mean, seriously, time flew Same. by this conversation. So I'm glad to know you. I did not know you before this, uh, you know, I checked, we weren't even connected on LinkedIn. So, um, you know, now I'm there and I'll be one of your minions. Um, <laughs> pretty pleased with sugar on top, like, or comment on one of my posts. Cause I understand that part of the algorithm. Uh, and, and by the way, you can always disagree with me. That's more fun in my opinion. I love the comments. So I call it fan mail. <laughs> um, 
anyway, uh, thank you so much for coming on and really appreciate all the knowledge you shared. This was fascinating and, and super helpful, I think, to a lot of our listeners. Yeah, yeah. Super, helpful. super helpful to the hosts as well. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Austin. No, it thank is, you guys for having me. I, I really appreciate it. And I had a blast. Fantastic. So, then we just got to do a, a little quick drop outro for our sponsor, Lead411. Um, fascinating that you can get mobile phone numbers, direct mobile numbers uh, through their platform, which we know in the work from home strategy is, is definitely becoming more and more needed. Um, so please go to Lead411, support them, check them out, tweet at them, thank them for supporting the podcast. Uh, and we'll talk to you again next time.